Uh, and I want to begin by welcoming to the gallery Natasha O'Brien. As you've said, Cahirlik, Natasha is here with us today, and I know everyone in this house will want to pay tribute again to her amazing tenacity, her resolution, uh, her courage and her honesty in speaking out not only about the horrific attack she endured in Limerick two years ago, but also about her experience uh, in the criminal justice process, her experience of the sentencing process, and her fearless advocacy on behalf of victims and survivors of violent crime. And I think Natasha has done a great service to the country by highlighting, shining a spotlight on an area of the criminal justice system that is crying out for reform. And I know, Minister, you agree on this, that it really does need reform. This is an area of law where, and of practice, more importantly, where we've seen you know, so many survivors, victims coming forward over the years to speak out about experiences. We have seen reforms made, but there's a great deal more that needs to be done to fix a system that is simply not providing sufficient support to victims and survivors. And I had the great pleasure and honour of sitting with Natalia Natasha this morning of hearing from her as to the, precisely the sort of change she wants to see made in the system and in particular the words if, Natasha if, if you don't mind me quoting you directly the words she spoke were so were so clear and so direct that she wants to see more common humanity in the system common humanity that's really what was lacking, what appeared to be lacking for so many victims in their experience of going through the criminal justice system. And that's what we need to change. And I know some of the changes can be made in the law. And we, in this motion uh, brought forward for Labour this morning, uh, have made eight significant calls on you, Minister, and on the government to change practice and to ensure a better system, a system that's more supportive for victims. But there is also a cultural shift that's needed to ensure that common humanity is, uh, is much more evident within the system, that judges, legal pr practitioners have more sensitivity towards the victims and survivors of crime before them in their courts, and indeed that we see uh, a fixing of any disconnect between the experience of the victim as expressed through the victim impact statement and the impact that has or appears to have on the sentencing decision or outcome in the case. And some of the asks in our motion are addressed specifically to that point. But I just want to thank Natasha so much again wholeheartedly for your bravery in coming forward and speaking publicly and in guiding us as to the areas where we need to see change. So Minister, all of us should be able to expect freedom from violence. And again, this is, requires a cultural shift because as we go about our business, commuting, working, spending time with friends, we should be able to take for granted that we can do so without fear, including in our homes. And again, an issue that Natasha's case has highlighted is the real epidemic of gender-based violence, much of it happening behind closed doors in domestic settings in, in homes. And it's unfortunate, it's deeply unfortunate, deeply distressing that for many people, uh, it's not the reality that they can go about their lives in safety, that both in and outside their homes, they're subject to acts of aggression which can have life-altering or even life-threatening consequences. Many in those subject to violence in their homes are subjected to corrosive and persistent violence and even in recent days, even since Natasha's case, we've seen reports of sentence decisions related to what we might describe as persistent ongoing harassment, abuse and horrific assault and sexual violence in homes. So the motion we Labour TDs have tabled today does not seek to engage in any philosophical conversation about the inevitable of violence, but we do believe that underlying the specific asks we've made is a request, a call for the sort of political and cultural change which is required to reduce and tackle that epidemic of gender-based violence and of aggressive violence more generally. We are also seeking, of course, to focus on how the state behaves after a person has been victimised, because, because what is, should be easier to tackle, what's not inevitable, is the way in which the courts deal with victims. And again, I stress that point of humanity and sensitivity. Far too many victims and survivors speak about an experience of re-victimisation, re-traumatisation through the courts. Of course, primary blame for the impact of violence, for lives were destroyed, for lives harmed. The primary blame, of course, rests with the perpetrator. That goes without saying. But responsibility for what happens next does lie with the state, with us as legislators, with government, uh, and with all of those charged with, with uh, working within the criminal justice system, so we must do better.
Uh, Natasha's experience and her, the attack she endured was utterly horrific. That she's put her head above the parapet takes an enormous amount of courage. But as I've said, we are so appreciative of her courage and of the courage of, of some who have spoken out before. And I'm thinking of Lavinia Kerwick, of Jessica Bowes, and more recently of Blonard Rally and others uh, who have spoken out about their experience with the hope that that will help us to achieve better supports and be a better system for all. And as a woman, as a feminist, and on behalf of Labour, but I think also on behalf of all of us in this House, I want to restate my thanks to Natasha and to those, those other brave survivors of the violent crime. Of course, thanks are not enough. And I do welcome, Minister, your decision not to oppose our motion today, indeed to support it, I hope, uh, to support the calls in the motion. Um, what will be crucial, of course, is the implementation of those calls and the speed with which the measures we have proposed is, are to be implemented. And we need to ensure that we're closing gaps in the law and that we're addressing uh, flaws in judicial or, or, or courtroom practice which are causing re-traumatisation. Uh, I worked, as you know, for many years in the criminal law system and I did see firsthand how ill-equipped aspects of our system are to deal with the reality of gender-based violence and of violent crime more generally. And I've done a good deal of work over the years with victims and survivors of crime seeking to improve systems and improve practices. But again, a great deal more needs to be done. So in this motion, we've called for a number of practical uh, measures which could be taken to address some of the gaps in the system. We've called for a review of the practice of suspended sentences and of the criteria used for applying suspension to uh, sentencing decisions for those convicted of violent crimes. For a long time, as long as I can remember, when I was in practice, there was concern about inconsistency in the use of suspension. What measures, what criteria were judges using? We established the Judicial, Judicial Council in 2019 with a view to improving consistency and again one of our asks is also that we would see increased urgency in the implementation of measures that the Judicial Council I know have been working on, the development of those sentencing guidelines that for decades now we've been calling for, uh, judges themselves have been calling for. We need to see clear guidelines also on the use of character references and I note the comments of Mr Justice Tony Hunt in recent days about the impact that character reference, references uh, should or should not have on sentencing outcomes. We also need to see that comprehensive database of judicial sentences because as many judges over the years have said it's very difficult for them to establish establish uh, baseline sentences for offences if they don't know what the, if they don't have the data on patterns of sentencing and we need to see uh, more uh, speed uh, um, in, in the work of the Judicial Council in doing that. We also need to see a review of Irish Defence Forces regulations to deal more proactively with members accused of or convicted of violent crimes and I've welcomed the Taoiseach's very strong commitment in that regard. Where a sentence is handed down, we see stories of the particulars of a violent crime leave the news cycle. But for a great many victims, of course, we know that the impact is so, uh, so much longer. Uh, since tabling our motion last week, I've heard from numerous survivors, and I know we all have. I heard from one survivor just in recent days with a very particular issue that, uh, that Minister, I will uh, just briefly bring to your attention and may speak with you about separately. Um, the perpetrator was convicted, she was, the victim was subjected to a really uh, very, very violent attack. The perpetrator has been serving uh, a sentence, uh, serving a term in the central mental hospital and as a result of that the victim is not entitled to information about release dates and that's something we have improved more generally for victims of uh, violent crime that where a perpetrator is to be released from prison information is provided about release dates. There's a gap there in respect of central mental hospital um, uh, detention. So we need to, uh, to address that, and I'll speak with you separately about that issue. But again, you know, the, the, the publicity, the courage of Natasha O'Brien in reporting her case has brought to light quite a number of these anomalies, and that's just one I wanted to raise. On sexual violence, I do want to acknowledge some very welcome progress has taken place, and you've, you've led on, on much of this. Passage of, the, of new legislation, moves to implement the O'Malley report, and of course the establishment of Cohen. But there is still a great deal more that needs to be done. And our, the second part of our motion specifically relates to issues around gender-based violence. We know that domestic, sexual and gender-based violence is both cause and effect of gender inequality. And on the Oireachtas Committee on Gender Equality, we dealt with, uh, with, with a number of the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly. And again, some of those are incorporated into our motion today. Because we were conscious that, it, that we have to refer more generally to gender inequality, to patriarchal systems, when we speak about gender-based violence. 
uh, and we must look at how the state treats uh, gender-based violence. We saw shocking statistics from Women's Aid, and again, those are incorporated into our motion. Over 40,000 disclosures of abuse against women and children made last year, a really shamefully high figure, and an increase of 18% on 2022 figures. Women's Aid also reports that since 1996, 266 women have died violently in this jurisdiction, and 63% of those killings have taken place in the victim's home. More than half of victims where cases have been, uh, where a perpetrator has been, has been, um, has been convicted, more than half were killed by a partner or ex-partner. So we're very conscious of the enormity, the epidemic, as we've said, not just of gender-based violence, but of domestic violence, violence in, uh, by partners or ex-partners and violence in intimate relationships. And yet we still aren't failing to provide refuge uh, for, for those victims and survivors who do come forward. More than half of domestic violence refuges around the country are full, and nine counties, as you know, Minister, remain without any refuge space for women and children children. Article 23 of the Istanbul Convention sets out a clear requirement to provide an adequate ratio of shelter relative to population and we currently fall short on achieving this international standard. Now over the years the Justice Committee and the Gender Equality Committee have, uh, have looked into this issue extensively and I know um, there's been many debates in this House and there is still that concern that really the, the focus of government, the focus of the state should be on removing the perpetrator from the home. It is shocking that in 2024 we're still having to provide shelter for women and children who are forced to flee to find shelter and the, you know, that is wrong and we should be seeking legal ways to ensure that the, it's the perpetrator who is removed in the first place. But we know that the reality remains that many women and children still have to flee from the family home and they need to have refuge space available. Um, Natasha said, um, as, as we know, that her experience of the court system was deeply traumatic. She's spoken about giving advice to others that it may be really difficult to report crime. And that's, really, again, really shocking, really distressing, because it's so important that crimes are reported. And again, just speaking of domestic violence, so much of it occurs behind closed doors, and so much of the court uh, procedures dealing with domestic violence occur behind closed doors. So it's vitally important, therefore, that we do hear from survivors, and we we do hear about experiences in order to uh, ensure we can make necessary changes. And again, our motion seeks to address that, looking for the introduction of a commissioner to act as an independent advocate and voice for victims and survivors. And that was something the Citizens Assembly had called for and that we in the Oireachtas Committee also called for in our report of December 2022. So Minister, I would welcome a response from you as to how you propose to implement the, these measures, some of which, as I've said, are already recommended, have been recommended for some years now. And we do also want to hear about uh, multi-annual funding for Cuan. That's something that, again, we heard, uh, we heard about the need for from so many of those uh, organisations providing shelters and support for women and children who are victims of violence. And we want to see increased resources in the budget of this year for Cuan but the commitment to multi-annual funding for rape crisis centres and DSGBV service providers is crucial because that will ensure a continuity of service <coughs> provision for, um, for, uh, uh, for survivors of, of violent crime. And that's really essential. We have made significant change, and I suppose I want to just finish by referring to some of the positive changes that have been made. The offensive course of control, which many of us fought really hard for in this house and in the Shannad, the new definition of consent in rape law. These are measures that, are, that have been really important in uh, ensuring be better, better uh, procedures in the criminal courts, better protections for victims. But we again need to look at how we are implementing those measures at Garda training, at judicial and court training, and we want to look at cultural change and I did want to finish on that because the cultural change which needs to take place to ensure that women are liberated from the fear of gender-based violence, that cultural change is the hardest to tackle. In, our, in the Oireachtas Committee, in the Citizens' Assembly, we looked at a whole range of measures that could tackle cultural change. Crucial to this is education, crucial to this is ensuring that boys and young men are, uh, are 
again, instilled with a sense of equality, that they don't regard women as objects in sexual terms. I think there's huge concern around preponderance of porn, around preponderance of uh, objectification of women through, um, through social media. And again, our, rec our report made recommendations about how to tackle that. Uh, we're very conscious that there's been a, a good deal of focus on culture within the Defence Forces, inevitably as a result of uh, Natasha's case. But it is crucially important that security organisations, organisations like the Guards, like the Defence Forces, whose primary purpose is to protect society, that they must have really robust structures in place to address any sense of, cult of a culture in which sexism, sexual harassment or abuse is tolerated. Uh, we owe a great debt to the Women of Honour who brought this issue forward. I know that the inquiry uh, into the Defence Forces and into culture is underway, but it falls to all, us all, women and men, to take a stand against se sexism, to take a stand to tackle any sense within, any, within our culture that gender-based violence or sexual abuse or sexual inequality is tolerated. And that's, again, the underlying issue in our motion.